Is it possible for a planet to have not one, not two, but many suns? Let's imagine what would happen to us if the sun suddenly decided to break into a bunch of small stars. During the search for Earth-like planets throughout the universe, scientists have discovered that systems of two or even three stars are not actually that rare. Many of them even have planets in their habitable zones. Almost half of these planets could contain life. Can't wait to ask these guys about the sunsets. Scientists even suggest that our sun wasn't always lonely. It could have had a companion star called Nemesis. They've noticed that mass extinctions on Earth occur every 27 million years. It's like a cycle. So they turned to the stars to find out what the reason might be. And then they assumed that it was a star that left our sun a long time ago, but it still affects us. Nemesis could be located about 1.5 light years from us. It may not sound like a lot, but it's actually almost 9 trillion miles. That's gonna be a fun car trip, 50 million years long. Anyway, every time Nemesis passes its orbit, it can affect the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is an area surrounding our solar system in which comets are formed. Its existence hasn't yet been proven, but scientists are pretty sure about it. So, comets form inside this cloud and then relocate to our solar system. Even being very far away, the second star in the system can have a great influence on it. But what about systems with four or even more stars? Is it even possible? Actually, yeah. But the more celestial bodies you add to the system, the more difficult it becomes. The orbits grow unstable. It's gonna be as chaotic as can be. In stellar mechanics, it's called the three-body problem. It says that it's very difficult to predict the orbits of bodies in such systems. In most cases, they turn out to be very random and unique. Isaac Newton was the first to have noticed it. He tried to apply his gravitational discoveries to the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. He found himself with quite a struggle. It wasn't easy to understand how three stellar objects orbit so stably around each other. And that's just a planet and a satellite. How about including several stars? I wouldn't envy those who will have to calculate all this. Oh, right, it's me. Anyway, we know that triple star systems are ridiculously chaotic. But what about systems with more stars? They're very, very rare. In 2021, NASA discovered a star system of as many as six stars. That's just crazy. Of course, there are no planets in it, but who knows? Maybe one day we'll find such a system too. In such worlds, the gravity dance is very complex. It takes very specific conditions to hold everything together. It's like walking on a tightrope over an abyss. With all this in mind, let's try to imagine what would happen if the sun suddenly turned into several small stars. Oh, <laughs> we're going to need a very detailed simulation. No, probably even a dozen simulations to make this thing work. Because otherwise, we'd only have a few options. Option 1. We divide the sun into 5 to 10 tiny suns. Now we'll scatter these guys not far from each other. They'll destroy our system in a couple of hours. Yeah. All star systems, including ours, are in constant motion across the universe. So, they'll crash into each other almost immediately. This collision will lead to the creation of a supernova. Our system will turn into a beautiful, colorful nebula. For us, it will happen in just a couple of minutes. We won't even have time to feel anything. And all the planets in the X solar system will immediately turn into sparkling space dust. Um, but it's not the best option for us, right? Let's see if it can go any other way. Option two. Since they can't be located so close to each other, Let's try to set them as far away as possible. And in this case, they'll just leave. Buh bye Their gravitational force is too weak to hold everything together. The little suns will simply leave the solar system, flying into space in random directions. After that, the rest of the planets will descend from their orbits, including poor little us, of course. We'll become a so-called rogue planet. At first, we won't even realize that the planet has gone out of orbit and we won't have time to do anything before it gets incredibly cold. 
What a sad and poetic end. In general, none of these outcomes sounds very fun. Oh, all right, we still have the last option. Our main problem is that we make each of these little stars the same mass. But just take a look at all these multi-star systems that we've already discovered. You'll see that none of them look like a bunch of glowing balls together. Instead, there are a couple of large stars there, and the rest, the small ones, are orbiting around them. So how about two large stars and two small ones? What will the Earth look like then? Well, its orbit will become terribly unstable. We'll shake back and forth. Wouldn't recommend it, honestly. We know what this can lead to because, and that's just crazy, this has already happened to us once. Yes, about 70,000 years ago, a lone star visited our solar system. It was a red dwarf called Scholz. A red dwarf is a very small and cold star. If you count 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit as cold, of course, but it's considered the weakest and coldest type of star, so it probably didn't look that big and bright in the sky. At that time, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, were already there living their lives. And can you imagine? They saw another star in the sky approaching the sun. I wonder what that looked like. And then, Scholz bypassed the sun and flew somewhere further to surf space. We weren't expecting some kind of disaster, were you? If it had happened, you wouldn't have had a chance to watch this video right now. But from this story, we can see what happens to the Earth during such stellar events. At that time, a huge amount of volcanic activity unfolded on our planet. We also got some meteor showers that almost wiped us out. Our ancestors sure had it rough. Something similar will happen on our hypothetical planet with four suns, but on a much greater scale. Constant volcanic activity, earthquakes and tsunamis, Brr. In addition, the length of a day will change, as well as the length of all seasons, and a year as a whole. They won't be stable anymore due to the regular changes in gravitation. In other words, you'll never know when to expect an annual winter or hot summer. And when we are precisely in the middle between two stars, there won't be any nights at all. They'll illuminate both parts of our planet, and we'll have to sleep in bright sunlight. And if you think this is a bad thing, keep in mind that we'll also be attacked by much more ultraviolet rays and solar winds because of our four suns. Their color will also change. They'll become red dwarfs, looking distinctly orange-scarlet in the sky. We'll also get many more solar eclipses, except instead of the moon, the sun would be eclipsed by another sun. It would probably just get a little darker. To be honest, it's unlikely that anything would survive on Earth after all this. I mean, it is possible, but please run a hundred simulations yourself if you want to make sure. But theoretically, we could survive in a simple binary star system. For example, in one that consists of two stars close to each other. Each of them would have to be two times smaller than our Sun. That would be the perfect scenario. And it's quite possible in the future. NASA is currently working on a plan to relocate our descendants to Proxima Centauri b. That's a planet near the closest star system to our Sun, Alpha Centauri. And who knows, maybe one day in the future, we'll really move there. Then we'll see what it's like to live with several suns. The Sun isn't technically the center of our solar system. It's in a space called the Berry Center. It depends on which planet you're standing in. The Berry Center is usually closest to the object with the greater mass. So, since we're on Earth, the true center of the solar system is the Sun, but not the center of it. With respect to Jupiter, the Berry Center is actually outside the Sun's surface. Jupiter is 318 times bigger than Earth, so the balance is different. The planets don't really revolve around the Sun, but around their common center of mass. Imagine balancing a pencil on the tip of your finger you'd have to place it right in the center so that it doesn't tip on each side. Because the pencil has its mass equally distributed, it's easy to assume that everything balances its way like that, especially in outer space. But try balancing a hammer on the tip of your toe. Chances are you'll walk out of here with a broken toe. Its true berry center is close to the hammerhead rather than the actual center where you'd grip it. 
Earth and the Sun's barycenter is like that hammer. The center of mass is more or less in the center of the object. Realistically, if the Sun were to rotate around Earth, then our little blue planet would have to be just as big as the Sun, or bigger. We can't disregard the other planets in our solar system, which means they all will have to rotate around us as well. But in the ancient days, bright minds always thought everything revolved around the Earth. They called this the geocentric model. And this made sense to them, because it looked like everything above us was spinning around us. The Sun and the Moon played vital roles in human history, and we didn't feel insignificant in the universe until way later on. In ancient Greece and the Middle Ages, the big brains used the geocentric model to study space. It wasn't until the 16th century that that model changed. Back in those times, they couldn't even imagine that everything revolved around the Sun. And they didn't have the knowledge to back any of this up. The Earth can't be the center of the solar system because it's not large enough for the job. For the conditions to suit the enormous size, life would have evolved differently. We'd probably be less dependent on oxygen. Some animals, like whales and dolphins, can stay for hours without taking a single breath. They can even sleep underwater. So the humans of the sun-sized Earth would have specialized lungs and wouldn't need to constantly be taking in air. It means that the plant life would be limited, with just a few shrubs here and there. There are trillions of trees around the world, but the main contributor to producing oxygen is the algae in the ocean. With such vast real estate of oceans and seas, the algae sitting on top are pumping out the air we breathe. Oxygen wouldn't be so abundant on this planet, but our breathing mechanisms might rely on carbon dioxide, another common gas found on other planets. If the planet is hot, then water will be scarce. We would only find it on certain parts of the planet, like mountaintops. The ground would be too scorched for anything to survive in properly. We can forget about seasons as well. The sun is currently just large enough to give us what we need. But since the Earth would be so large, and the sun would be another celestial body emanating heat, we'd always feel like we're inside a microwave. The days and nights will be different, and not much precipitation will happen. With so much heat produced in the core, earthquakes and volcanoes would likely erupt all the time. The surface would practically be a scorching plain of red magma floating around. This would be the true red planet. But if we had the same landscape like on Earth, living somewhere near the mountains could save you. The mountains would still be embedded in the core, but it would be better than staying on the ground. Some of the mountain peaks could even be 100 times taller than Mount Everest. The canyons could be so deep that the Mariana Trench would feel just like a little rupture. Animals would also behave and look different. Cold-blooded animals would have to soak up as little sun as possible so they don't burn. Animals would have to rely on migration to find water in distant lands. Birds can fly for hundreds of miles for migration season so we'd probably see certain sleek-looking birds speeding through the air. But because gravity would be so strong on the colossal-sized Earth, the flying animals would need thinner bones and a thinner core just to take flight. The real survivors would be the microorganisms. They can live in extreme temperatures and pressures and can live without oxygen for a good while. The nights would be dark since there wouldn't be any moon to reflect the sunlight the moon would most probably be on the opposite side of where the sun is shining, so it would forever be a floating ball in the sky. The Earth's rotational speed is the fastest at the equator, so if all the planets and the sun rotated around us, then our rotation wouldn't be so significant. New weather patterns wouldn't be good for crops. Humans would have evolved differently from what we are like now. We'd probably be shorter and stockier since gravity is so strong. And because of the soaring temperatures, we'd probably live in caves all around the world. The strongest ones would have migrated to the mountains. We'd probably have the same evolutionary path as we do now, but other physical features might be different. Our pigment would likely look different to combat the heat. The desert fox has large ears for hearing out predators and for cooling itself down in the scorching desert heat. It's possible that we would also have bigger ears than what we have now for the latter reason. We'd be a lot stronger than we are, and our bones would be thick and tough to break. 
Gravity is one of the key components to developing our bone density and muscle mass. This means we would unlikely need tools for hunting. This would have delayed the Bronze Age and modern civilization as we know it. With little vegetation, standing upright wouldn't be so necessary to find predators around us. We wouldn't be the fastest runners either, but we'd be strong enough to fight off a pack of strange-looking wolves. And if the Earth was supersized, then it's possible that multiple species of humans would be roaming the land in isolated areas. Some human species would grow and evolve into the intelligent thinkers of today, but some would remain the same. And some creatures from the past would still be around, unchanged. Sharks would have been around since the dinosaurs era. They wouldn't have to change their form or adapt because of their dominance. Other animals would remain the same because of their isolation. The Galapagos Island hosts some unique animals because they've been alone for so long. Without proper predators constantly lurking around them, they don't fear humans. The new mega-sized Earth would have areas as large as Asia filled with isolated animals that could remain the exact same as when they first appeared. The human species of those regions would also remain the same, since they wouldn't have moved or experimented with anything. Their diet would remain the same, and they would get used to the climate they're in. Technology would also have flourished differently in various parts of the planet. With some areas in complete isolation, they wouldn't have access to new gadgets and inventions. It would be like living on a planet with different eras in the present day. Other areas would be so advanced, they might even be flying themselves outside the planet in search of truth and answers. Our gravity is good enough for us to live properly and develop life, but if we pumped up our size to that of Jupiter, then gravity would crush us. And being the size of the sun, Earth wouldn't even be a planet, but a brown dwarf, and would constantly be burning until it became a new sun. As of now, Earth is so small in our universe that we're practically like a grain of sand in the desert. On a cosmic level, we're an insignificant contribution to this universe. Ah, beautiful! You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the… Stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals, flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into this super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves, or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. 
If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes. Maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour. So watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous. But the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! (laughs) You get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. 
people have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously, but after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really.